Moderating today's panel on what healthcare can learn from retail is Bob Tedeschi, senior writer at STAT. Joining him on stage are our panelists, Kathy Klingler, chief marketing officer and SVP, product and marketing at Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts. Brian Lefkowitz, EVP, Executive Creative Director of Digitas Health, and Mitch Rothschild, founder and chairman of Vitals. All right, thanks everybody for coming. Um, we've got a fantastic panel and few minutes already. So I want to jump right in, um, set the context, and then get to our panelists. Uh, even before Amazon announced that they'd be entering the healthcare industry, they were like the elephant in the room, right? Showing leaders of every industry that change is coming, it's consumer-centric change, and you'd best adjust or you're not going to be able to compete. And healthcare industry leaders seem to understand this, even if the industry has been its usual methodical self in generating some momentum in this regard. So let's, let's just stipulate for the moment that uh, we're headed for big changes in healthcare. We're moving toward a more retail-centric type of approach that might be best characterized as the Amazonization, don't, don't use that word, of healthcare. <laughs> we could go back and forth about when this is gonna happen, um, but I think it'd be far more useful for us to talk about how and why that's starting to happen now, that shift is starting to um, happen. So with that as the backdrop, um, when you guys are talking with your colleagues and counterparts about, health, about healthcare delivery, how do you start to frame the discussion around building an experience that's similar to what Amazon has built in retail? And we're talking about on-demand, intuitive, personalized care. How critical is it to think about that more customer-centric or patient-centric approach right now, and, and why is that critical? So we'll start with you, Kathy. Okay, so um, I guess I would say for us, it's a mandate for our organization. We have, we've, I guess we've always been considered a member's first organization, but for us, it's come back to in what way for the member. And as an organization at the top of the house, a couple years ago we made the decision it's all about the consumer and we need to really put a focus and an emphasis on what is that future experience going to look like. And so it's start at the top of the house, our board, our CEO, it has sort of permeated across our organization and it has driven a lot of change for us organizationally um, in terms of a multi-year roadmap. We can talk about that later. But, you know, we've, it's not a project to us. It's not something that we say, there's a couple of things we need to do. We say in order to succeed in the future, we need to put the consumer at the center of our thinking. We need to build our services around them to make them successful. And ultimately that will change healthcare. Thank you, Brian. I mean, for us, um, I would say, you know, when you look at Amazon and the friction that they removed um, from the retail space uh, on just actually how you do purchases, we're taking that same parallel in healthcare and how do we remove friction? So you think about the way we deliver information, the way we support patients and physicians, um, the way we ultimately are trying to, you know, change adherence, um, as well as build trust, because there's not a lot of trust. So how do we create trust within that? Um, all to ultimately change a, and, and create a seamless experience when it comes to healthcare. Maybe a contrarian approach. Let's hear what you've got to say about this. I would say Amazon is probably a um, false metaphor in that when you have a third party payer um, and you're delivering a service and the price is fluid, everybody pays different prices depending on their deductible and their plan design, um, it's somewhat challenging to make that comparison. Having said that, there are places where along commodity lines, healthcare is starting to consumerize places like telemedicine or urgent care centers or the way farm uh, drugs are delivered through uh, PBMs and others. But it's a, it's a very slow process, partly because consumers don't really know cost and quality the way they should. The tools are available, but most consumers have not kind of had that in their system to access it. And the places where you see the consumerization, I would say the wellness clinics that you see at CVS and Walgreens or the urgent care centers where you've got walk-in, customer service, um, no appointment necessary, all those kind of components um, are where I think we're beginning to see it. 
Um, but it is, I think we shouldn't fool ourselves to think that it's not a challenge in healthcare in that the third party payer and the variable pricing are two very big rocks to have to navigate around. Mm -hmm. And we'll get to in a little bit about how, how to get around those rocks. Uh, mm -hmm. But for now, I wanna, I wanna ask about some concrete examples that you've seen either inside your organizations or externally of the types of programs or initiatives that are showing promise in this regard. Um, you know, and be as specific as possible here so folks can have some, some real practical takeaways. Yeah, um, well, we have the ability to listen to customers like we've never been able to. Brands have the ability um, to listen to all their customers, not just patients, but physicians also. Um, and we are taking that data and fueling content and brand experiences based on that. So um, there's a direct effect, you know, um, specifically, we run some of the um, two of the largest uh, therapeutic social communities um, that are out there on Facebook. Um, what we learn from patients and physicians, the conversations that they're having, just, you know, you, we use those those conversations to make decisions on how we dictate our brand, where we are from a marketing perspective, from media, the messages that we're putting out there, how we reach them, um, and when we reach them. I would, I guess, I would say for us, I'd piggyback off the um, the data and listening to customers. We have set up a almost a thousand person idea community is what we call it, where we are out there listening and learning. Um, from our customers and consumers every single day. And that information is what is fueling how we're thinking about our, this, this multi-year roadmap to transform the experience. For us, it really started with what we think is probably the, the core of it is around the financial side of their health care. We heard from them over and over, we're confused about our plan, we're confused about the cost, why does my neighbor pay this for the MRI and I pay this for the other MRI? How do we help them in that journey better understand um, the financial side of healthcare? So for us, we've kind of thought about it in a couple ways. We've taught, thought about it from how do we help them start to think like retail consumers and shop for care? And we have a really good partner to my left here who helps us with that. How do we think about actually paying for care and how do we think about planning for care? And so for us, it's been a journey in terms of thinking about how do we support our member through that experience. Today, what I would say, and an opportunity I think we have is, and I've only been about a year at it, is that today we have a lot of point of sale solutions. We have a lot of different tools, but I don't think yet we have really have brought those tools together to really help our members understand where and how to use them, which is why I believe we have low utilization. And I think as marketers, we have a real opportunity to figure out what are those moments, what are those trigger moments throughout their experience where we can actually insert ourselves in a valuable way to help drive down costs or bring more value to them or even impact the quality of care. And I think there's an opportunity for us to do that. Can you describe a couple of those tools that you're talking about? Just yeah. so it's a little more concrete. Sure, so when I talk about shopping for care, one of the things that we think about is the common tools that you would think about, you know, find a doctor, cost estimator, but we also partner with Vitals on what we've called our Smart Shopper tool, which I, which I think is pretty interesting, where now you have the opportunity to actually shop for certain services and compare the pricing. Now, that's really unusual for us, right? As consumers, imagine you're in front of your provider and they say, we want you to go get your MRI here, and you pull up your phone and say, well, I really want to go here because I can see the cost. But think about all the pressure that's being put on us as consumers. More than ever, we now have more cost on, on our backs. The burden of the cost is on us. How I believe we have a responsibility to help them think about how they can shop differently for that care, how they can ask the right questions, how they feel empowered to do that. So that's an example around shopping. Paying for care, I think, ties back to a lot of the financial accounts that exist out there. And how do we weave that into the equation and help consumers better understand how to use those financial accounts, whether it's an HSA, an HRA, an FSA. There's confusion, there's lack of knowledge. How do we help them use them? How do we integrate those experiences together? And then the last one where we talk about planning for care, which is something that we're talking more about, is how do we use our data? We are sitting on this incredible amount of data where we can see your past history. We can, in some ways, predict what may happen with you and around the population of you. How do we help you think about planning differently in the future? Because in our community, we hear a lot of questions around, I don't know what plan to use. I don't know what's right for me. Can you give me guidance? Can you help me? So how do we help them think like the retail consumer and begin to consume it a little bit differently? That's, that's a fascinating one for me only because it, it pulls into um, the discussion questions about uh, clinical, I guess, what's proper clinically and what's best for the patient. Whereas if you deliver something like an Amazonian experience where it's like, patients who did this tried this, 
yeah. um, you know, you're taking a risk. Uh, <laughs> yeah. In the medical. You'd be surprised, though, how much in our communities yeah. people have come back to us and said, you know, I'd love to see whatever, you know, people want to hear from others. Like, they want, people want you to go in and say, I had my MRI here, and what was my experience? I had my MRI there, because, you know, you imagine there's this sort of behavioral thing around, if it's less money, it's not as good of a quality. Well, that's not really necessarily true. So people like, people like us, to go in and be able to talk about what was their experience, what was their ratings. I mean, and that's sort of Amazonian-like, I suppose. That's a hard word to get my head around. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I'm sorry. Or retail-like, let's call that. Okay, great. I just wanted to piggyback off something you said about Smart Shopper, because Smart Shopper, which is a, a product we have, is really an amazing adventure in the world of consumerism. Yeah. Um, if you, there's about 100 or so different procedures where the cost can vary wildly without any difference of quality. So if we take the MRI example you used, it can cost anywhere from $900 to $4,000, depending on where you get the care. Here in Massachusetts, Shields Imaging versus uh, Mass General, you'll have a $3,000 differential. So we've done two things with Smart Shopper on the consumerization side. One is we've got a phone bank of what we call personal assistance, where people can call in and we will spend as much time on the line with them explaining the choices, um, what the out-of-pocket is for them after uh, the health care pays, uh, where they would go, get them an, an Uber or a Lyft back and forth to the place, make the appointment for them. And then even more dramatically, we will actually pay the patient money to switch care. So a $1,000 MRI versus a $4,000 MRI, if you've got a third-party payer, um, any employer, and we give $300 to the consumer for going to that $1,000 place, the, the payer's still only in for $1,300 versus the $4,000. The consumer gets a $3,000 check, and we're able to switch over close to 60% of all people we engage with to go to those places where you've got good quality at a much lower price. Um, it's consumerization. It's the opposite of Amazon because we're paying the patient to do something as opposed to the other way around. But in the sort of topsy-turvy economics of healthcare, that works. Yeah, I think that's a. I think that's a great. I think that's a great parallel to even if I think about other retail industries. I, you know, I've come from banking, and if we just think about like the cha the behavioral change that they put us through with going into brick and mortar, moving us to ATMs, and moving transactions out of ATMs, and incenting us to do it, going from ATMs to online banking, and incenting us to go on and direct deposit and pay bills. You know, I sort of liken it a little bit to that. That you know, I think those types of services begin to, tr to train people to think differently about that they have a choice and they can be em empowered. Um, but, you know, it's not habitual, right? It's new, but I think there's a real opportunity with things like, with tools like that. Right, and it is, you know, give Amazon credit where credit's due. They did have trained us to be different consumers, right? They in have. Our, in terms of our expectations and our habits, um, and we're sort of trying to pull that into the, the healthcare realm. Um, the question is how we how can you train consumers and patients to do it more effectively? Um, aside from that, do you have any other ideas for how you can start to um, edge into the consumers' uh, habits and have them change just how they think about shopping for healthcare? Is there anything that comes off the top of your head aside from giving them cash back, which is <laughs> do it? I, it's it's as effective a blunt <laughs> instrument as we've go. come up with, and, and bribes work in many venues. This happens to be a legal form of it. <laughs> I mean, I, yeah. From a, you know, just the simple TV commercial and the the phrase of "talk to your doctor," which we've all heard over and over again thousands of times. We're actually looking at that three second little sound bite and say, "Talk to Alexa or talk to Surrey," because we can make a direct communication with the brand there um, or the disease that we're trying to solve in order to get information now opposed to wait till I get to my doctor's office and have that conversation. So how do we have those conversations now in real time when it's instant and when they're being exposed to the brand um, to continue with that relationship? Hmm. Yeah, and I, and I also think that, you know, data is just so critical in this. Like, you know, the, let's think of the amount of data that we're sitting on and we can see claims data, we can see pre-authorization data, we can see if somebody wants to be pre-authorized for something, you know, having the ability in a real-time way, you know, you're on your mobile, you're at an office, and we can see a pre-auth to be able to push out a, a notification and remind them of another service that they have. So I think it's going to take that type of, you know, insertion, but in ways that bring value. Uh, you know, otherwise they're going to check out, right? So I think it's, it's about changing behavior, and I think data can really help if you can use that data, marry it with sort of a, a digital platform and a messaging platform that allows you to reach the consumer in a retail way. 
I, my hypothesis is that over time, we can begin to change people's behavior. We'll see. And it might sound a little creepy, but um, these devices that we're putting in our households these days can also listen to our conversations, right. as well as marry our search data. It is creepy. So, so yeah, right? <laughs> and, and so depending on your level of uh, privacy, and what your, what your uh, acceptance level is for those intrusions, um, these services may actually start pushing you information about yeah. medical right. con conditions that you didn't think you shared with anybody. And there's conversations about that happening within the doctor's office. So you think about EMRs, for instance, which was a technology that was introduced with a bad user experience because essentially the patient and the doctor became disengaged with each other because the doctor started doing this as opposed to like looking at their patient's eyes. And they have found a way to adopt to that by going to tablets and going to recording systems like, you know, Alexa or someone like that to capture that content in a different way so they can stay engaged with their patients. Unless we'd get too far ahead of it yes. ourselves, and that's my own <laughs> fault with the Alexa thing. But um, I'm, I'm curious to talk a little bit about um, the, the obstacles to delivering these experiences um, now and, and how you get past that. And some of them I know are you know, just pure demographic, and I'd like to hear what you think about that. Sure. Well, as you had said earlier, I mean, change is difficult, and the earlier in a journey that somebody uh, changes before they establish habits, that will obviously give the greatest result. The key statistic for me in terms of where change is going to come from is that a little north of 70 percent of all millennials do not have a primary care doctor, um, which is more than uh, double the number for baby boomers, let's say. So if you do not have a primary care doctor, once you do need care, that's places where folks like uh, CityMD, ZocDoc, uh, a service on demand will come in, in which case all the requirements to treat the customer right in terms of customer service, uh, short wait times, patient reviews, all that kind of stuff. And I. Um, as the, the challenge, of course, is that millennials are, just by the nature of the age, healthier than folks in their 60s or 70s. But as that works its way through the system, um, the fact that people don't have a primary care doctor and are essentially shopping for care on a fairly urgent need, that will force consumerization to happen. Mm -hmm. It'll take a while, but the seeds are planted. Right, so it's, it almost bears uh, taking a look at the demographic profile as it's sort of making its way through. Uh, to stage whatever you're going to implement. Mm -hmm. um, Brian, what do you think? Yeah, I know. Come in. <laughs> Maybe it's code. Um, <laughs> <Whip -tacker? laughs> I was going to say uh, patient privacy. I mean, okay. that obviously is highly sensitive. Uh, healthcare is a very personal um, subject. Not everybody is, wants to have everything about themselves exposed out there. So, um, you know, technology is moving faster than the way, than faster than we can actually protect it. So um, going through those steps, making sure that we're being very respectful to patients and their privacy and uh, being selective of when we share information. What kind of pushback have you seen even now uh, on that res in, in that regard? Um, I was shocked, you know, a million years ago when I started doing reporting on, on online privacy and cookies, when people were objecting to cookies back mm. in the day. Yeah. Um, and yet, that was all the, the, the talking heads and the analysts suggesting that, that people are going to be really um, uncomfortable with it. But when it comes to it, when it comes down to it, they'll sell that in a heartbeat. Right. Um, so what kind of pushback have you seen on the privacy front from consumers or that you've heard from your clients? Um, well, I mean, for one thing, they don't want the brand involved, patients. They want to be having conversations that are outside of what feels like marketing. So um, a lot of the social platforms that we create or the communities that we create on Facebook or other um, platforms um, are brand agnostic. We're listening, um, we're supporting, and we're financially paying for it, um, and, and that's what we get in return. Um, but it is open for them to, to grow and to um, connect with each other. Patients want to connect with patients, to your point earlier. Um, because they want to, it is, it is that Amazon model of like, patients like me. They want to know they're not alone. Um, they want to know there's other people that are out there. And they want to know they can also be anonymous if they have to be. Um, so the, the community serves a huge purpose from that respect um, as far as helping us support our insights. 
and it helps to not be branded in that respect? Well, like I said, I, we want them to be able to talk about brands freely, not just our brand. And even when they do talk about br our brands, we have to be, you know, we have to report things and it becomes a, a much muckier, um, you know, um, conversation. So we step out and we just watch and listen. And, uh, and that's what we get in return as sort of, um, as, as arbiters of the, uh, as helping shepherd that sort of community. Interesting. Kathy, I'm like, <laughs> I know, if I had a broomstick. Just start dancing. <laughs> like, um, I guess what I would say for me, I think one of the biggest obstacles is just the fragmented nature of, of this industry. You know, you have, you know, employers and members and payers and healthcare systems, pharmacy companies and, you know, um, boutique niche market players that are all sort of surrounding the consumer. And so I think when you talk about building an end-to-end -end experience, you know, it's really hard, right? How do you control that experience if the experience goes across different constituents and different types of stakeholders? And you know, I think you know. I think it's going to take time. I think a lot of it relates to partnerships and collaboration with partners. I think for us, um, at, you know, an, an immediate focus for us is, and something that I think the retail companies have done very well is they own the experience and they decide what that experience needs to be. Um, you know, think about Amazon. They're working with a lot of different partners. They own the experience. It is an Amazon experience. You know, UPS delivers our, our packages, but it's Amazon. And, you know, they control that experience. They know the data. They're watching us. They're evolving. I think for us, it's important to control that experience and understand what you can control and partner with others and use digital and technologies like APIs and other things to bring in what's appropriate to be able to, to have an integrated, seamless experience. We hear from our members. We've just launched a new mobile app, and you know it's doing very well. We've you know we focused on the financial side. We focused on personalization. Um, we focused on you know you have the ability to actually now see your you know your um, policy. You can see your claims. You can see your financial account. You can see the whole financial picture. And now what they're saying is, well, why can't I get my Fitbit in there? Can I see my how I'm running? How I can I, can I see my rewards program? We want to have it all in one. So I think you have to make a decision on what that experience should look like, what you can deliver upon, and try to sort of own that because I think it's going to take time with this fragmented nature. Well, the, the ownership part of it is, is the thing that makes my eyebrows raise because it, you and everybody else wants to own that, right? We do. And so the question is whether or not the patient wants you to own that. Very true. Or, or do, they, do I want to have an experience instead with my primary care for provider or my true. hospital or what it might be? And how do you intuit that? And how do you design in a flexible way so that you're actually serving the patient? Because remember, that's where ostensibly we're going, right? Well, that's uh, where the, center. yeah, I mean, I, th I think it's a really good point because you can go in a community of a thousand people and some say, oh, that's really creepy. I don't want that. And others really want that. I think that's the beauty of personalization. So if you really can be sitting on a platform that allows you to deliver content and connections in different ways, it can be personalized to you. And then all roads lead back to Amazon or Apple <laughs> or Google. Who? <laughs> uh, or Reddit. Um, okay. uh, we, did it. we actually find the opposite of privacy as the issue. Um, getting sick is lonely. Uh, you kind of feel alone. And we've got one site called MedHelp that has 300-odd patient communities. 15 million people a month are coming on those sites, talking to each other, comparing notes, um, talking about their own illness. In some cases, it's good Samaritans. In other cases, it's just sharing the misery. And we actually need to have moderators to keep private information from uh, getting too public there. So I think there is uh, a desire. We as a species are kind of a social, we're a social group and we want to cluster together. And Reddit, which has created all these communities in other venues, we find in healthcare. Um, if you've got multiple sclerosis, you want to talk to other folks across that have it, and the same issues you're grappling with, they're grappling with, whether it's uh, pharmaceutical issues or mobility issues or whatever. I agree 100%. We see the same thing inside our community. I mean, we set up the community as a, a way to be, you know, very, you know, to want to be consumer centric, you got to be listening all the time. And, you know, we of course go in with questions to be able to, like, think about R&D and new products and marketing, whatever it is that we feel like we want to involve them in. But what's hap what happens in those communities is they create their own relationships in those communities. And so what's amazing is to watch them start the dialogues, start them talking about things and going off in ways you've not scripted, which is really what you want. That's where the nuggets really come right. from. And you can really find those special areas of opportunity as an organization to bring value. So I 100% I agree. Um, we've only got a few minutes left. I'm, I'm 
curious because we've been floating around, uh, you know, a, a bunch of different topics, but I don't have in my head a vision for what this kind of nirvana of healthcare will look like uh, three, five, ten years from now. Um, that that looks more like this patient-centric, consumer-centric model that everybody talks about. So if you can think about um, one situation that you think sort of captures what that might look like, um, and then and then you know put a put a stake in the ground. How many years do you think before we get there? Um, who wants to take a whack at that? <laughs> That's a tough I'll one. I'll, I'll start. <laughs> if you go back 10 years, um, virtually all care was delivered in a hospital setting or a doctor's office setting. Over the course of the last decade, there has been an explosion of urgent care centers and imaging centers and wellness clinics and telemedicine, all of which are ambulatory surgery centers, all of which are singular focused on a certain thing, do it really well, kind of that level of specialization, do have a customer-centric approach. And I think you will see that there are going to be these centers of excellence. Um, you know, one of the big challenges in healthcare, is, as, as Kathy said, is there's virtually no correlation between cost and quality. And so if you can bring the cost down and deliver a good consumer experience, and you can look at Teladoc, and you can look at Shields Imaging, and you can look at any of those folks, or CityMD, any of those folks that are creating these um, freestanding medical facilities that are consumer-centric and are essentially retail, because consumer uh, medicine is retail as a service. Um, Today, it's just that you sit there and you wait, and the medical economics are that a doctor stacks up the patients so that um, they're not wasting any of their time and they can maximize the value. When you flip that on its head and say, let's go to the most cost-efficient, quality-efficient folks that just do one thing, ambulatory surgery centers that just do um, orthopedic work are going to be much more efficient than a hospital that does 18 different types of operations, both in terms of quality and um, cost, and I think that's where the future is heading. The elimination of the hospitals? Um, there will always be a need for them. Um, I believe that um, over the last two years, we've actually had fewer hospitals in this country rather than more. I think we, we tend to over, hospitals do way too many things. There should be almost no ambulatory activity in a hospital. You're clearly, you're going to need it for um, infectious diseases, but if you need a chemotherapy or a drug, go to an infusion center. You don't really need to go to a hospital. Um, and so I think it's going to become more narrowly specialized about what those organizations do. Hmm. They can all they can all move into all the retail space that's going to be abandoned. Yes. <laughs> um, for me, it's around service design, and I'll, a little bit about hospitals, because I just got out of one about two weeks ago. Um, and my experience was not much different than walking into the West than that I usually walk into, in that I walked up to a desk. There was someone that greeted me. She handed me a bottle of water. Um, I gave her my card. She knew who I was. She saw my vitals. She fast-tracked me to a room. And within an hour, I was out of there with a cast on my arm. So it was a much different experience than I had, let's say, 16 years ago, un unfortunately, where I broke the seam arm and uh, it was a four to six hour wait in a waiting room to then finally be seen and we all know that story. So um, seeing the service design change in the hospital was remarkable. Um, and then um, I work in psoriasis, which is a, a probably 15 to 20 really solid medications that are out there that help psoriasis patients. They're all slightly different. They're all really good. Some of them you take three pills a day, some take four pills a day, some's a shot, some's not. But where, where service design is going to play a role is how do we surround that pill? What, you know, when I talk to doctors about what, you know, what they prescribe, it's so much so the relationship he has with the pharma company and how they help him help his patients to make sure that every one of them are covered, to make sure they have the support when they walk out of here, to make sure they have the adherence app on their phone um, so they know that they're going to stay on their, not stay on their pills. So how we help physicians manage their patients because they have less and less time with them, how we support patients to stay adherent and, um, and healthy um, from a medicational standpoint. Brands are investing in that. Mm. Uh, Kathy, we're not going to put you on the hook for predicting where exactly Blue Cross Blue Shield will be. <laughs> Please don't. <laughs> but if you, if you had to design or, or at least envision one piece of the medical experience, you know, three, five, ten years from now that's significantly different from what we have now, what would it look like, you think? As more so I guess I, I don't know if I would 
maybe I'll answer a little differently. I guess okay. what I would say is, and this could be completely crazy, so don't hold me to this, um, but you know, if I look at other industries who are more mature from a retail perspective, and you know, there's much more transparency of cost, and there's much more personalization, and consumers have much more control. They, they're starting to form. They, they start to drive what the market looks like. And so, you know, I continue to believe if consumerism continues, you know, it's fragmented. I'm not, I don't know the time frame of this. You know, I think there could be a world where we dictate what we want, that we understand our health needs. And we say, you know, today you go to your employer and they give you a plan and you check off what you're going to go and you kind of go. Like, wh why couldn't there be a world where I better understand my needs for me and my family and these specialists and, that are around us are better understood and transparency of cost is better understood so that I could create the health experience that I want. Similar, but maybe not the best analogy to how my child thinks he's building his own sneakers, but he's not. He's <laughs> picking the colors and the laces. But, you know, I think there is something in industries around us where we now want to take control of our own experience and if the the um, transparency can exist maybe perhaps we could get to that world all right we should all be so lucky thank you to our panelists thank you, thank you guys very much for thank being you. a good audience and bearing with that <laughs> <laughs>